Are you looking for a new job? Are you hiring but can't find diverse, talented candidates? Then we have something that can help, our job board. Head on over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to browse listings or to place your own. This week on the job board, Uber is looking for a product designer. This is a remote position for those in San Francisco, Seattle, or the Pacific time zone, though they are also looking for people in New York City. Northern Kentucky University is looking for a visual communication design lecturer in Highland Heights, Kentucky. And OwnUp is looking for a product designer. This is a remote position. For just $99, we will feature your listing on our job board for 30 days and help spread the word about it to our audience of listeners. We also offer an annual job board subscription for companies and organizations. Make sure to head over to revisionpath.com forward slash jobs for more information on these listings and others. Apply today and tell them you heard about the job through Revision Path. Get started with us and expand your job search today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. This week, I'm talking with author, speaker, and instigator of inspiration, the one and only Kevin Carroll. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Kevin Carroll, author, speaker, instigator of inspiration. I get an opportunity to spend time with uh, co-conspirators and storytelling, creativity, innovation, human performance, and advancing the human condition in a good and positive way. So I get a chance to do that on the regular. That sounds like a dream job. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if it's necessarily, uh, you know, it's so funny. One of the things that, uh, I tell folks is I don't really have a job per se. I'm kind of like Tommy from from Martin Lawrence show, right? <laughs> yeah. So my friends always say, what do you do? Like, what do you do? Because like you're always here and there and there. And so I think I just have discovered that folks see a talent or a gift or skill that I might have that would lend itself to a project or an idea or a or something that they're trying to advance. And so I don't really see myself as having a job in a traditional sense, a J-O-B. Mm-hmm. I really do think that I have this career portfolio. I actually was reading an article about that, right? Why you should build a career portfolio, not a career path. And so mm-hmm. I think I have a, a series of experiences. So I have more portfolio than a career path. How has 2022 been going for you so far? Surprise and delight. And expect the unexpected. That's what's been happening uh, so far this year already. And I've been, uh, you know, really blessed and count my blessings. We've stayed healthy this entire time. And I think that that's allowed me to double down on optimism and positivity and to put out in the world some good energy. And that good energy is being reciprocated and reflected back. So it's been really wonderful. Some of the different projects that I've been invited to be a part of. Um, find opportunities to do a little bit of travel already. So some really fun um, locations. I was at the University of Oklahoma recently where I did some work with uh, students on campus, but also student athletes on the campus there and also in the community of Norman, Oklahoma. So that was really uh, exciting. And then I literally just got back from an event where I spoke to 5,000 people, a live event. And that's the first time, you know, a large group like that has been together. It was in DC. And I was telling a friend that I got a chance to see the the African American Museum, right? The you know the National African American Museum of Art. I had not seen it like sitting on the you know as you drive by it. Mm-hmm. And, you know most of the buildings. If you've ever been in D.C., Maurice, I don't know if you spent much time there. You know most of the buildings are white, and mm-hmm. here is this building that's this beautiful bronze brown. And it just stands out and it feels so warm and inviting. 
And so I got to see that yesterday, actually. I got there on Sunday and we were driving through and it was a sunny day and it just stood out. And I was so inspired to see that. So, you know, that event with 5,000 people was actually in DC. So I think that was a great sign for me to realize that wonderful things are coming this year. And that's a great source of inspiration to see a building like that and to think about all the voices and actions and impact that uh, black and brown folks have been making. And I want to join forces with that. So that's my goal, right, is to keep advancing that kind of intention that you would find in a building like that. Nice. I mean, I think it's, it's definitely great to come across that sort of, I guess, realization like that, especially during Black History Month. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it fell right on the last two days of Black History Month. So it was great timing to see that building. And that didn't, uh, it wasn't something that I was unaware of, right? I was paying attention to that. And I also talked about the importance of being where your feet are, right? And being present. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of folks don't do a great job of is being present. So that's something that's really been helpful for me is being present. So I guess given that, like, what do you want to achieve this year? Did that kind of put like an idea in your head about what you want to do? I don't ever really have like a, I want to grow my business X percent or I want to, I don't have those kinds of uh, metric measurable per se. My whole thing is just, you know, at the end of the year, can I reflect back and see that I advanced the human condition in a positive way and I had impact in some way that really will have a, will reverberate. That's the thing that I always look at is like, what were some of the moments? What were some of the things? And so I just want to continue to do that. A big thing for me is I'm chasing significance, not success. Mm. That's what I'm chasing, right? Success is attainable and, and you can have a measure of success at any age, quite frankly, but significance takes time, right? And that's the long game. And that's the collective measure of all the impact that you've had. And so that's what I'm pursuing. So this year is just another part of that mosaic, right, of that journey and chase to significance. I mean, you're doing so many things, as you mentioned at the at the top of the show. You're you're an author, you're a speaker, you're an instigator of inspiration. And I'm curious, like, what does an average day look like for you? Probably not an average day. I, I mean, they can very, uh, there's always some structure to what I'm trying to accomplish each day. And I do like to make sure that I feel inspired at some point. I'm always looking for opportunities to connect with folks. And I have a very curious spirit about me. And so I think a, a typical or average day is, can be captured in this quote by Albert Einstein. I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. So I like to be passionately curious each day. And so whatever that unfolds or brings my way, that's what I'm about. So it could be doing a, three virtual keynotes because we can do that now, right? So <laughs> they necessarily got to get on a plane to working on a collaboration with a sports program or sports team or university or you know, doing some reverse mentoring with my godson where he actually teaches me art or Legos or something. And I'm learning from him and he's nine years old and he's brilliant. And, you know, I enjoy doing that. So I just think that every day that's my end goal is, was I passionately curious today or not? Yeah, I definitely think that the way that, you know, these past few years have been in many ways, it's opened up a lot of different avenues for people to try different things, to to just pursue different types of work and stuff like that. So I like that idea of just being curious and kind of seeing where things go. That's a really, I mean, for me, at least I can't say it for the listener, maybe, but for myself, that feels <laughs> like super aspirational to be able to, to have that kind of freedom to do that. And I mean, you've been doing it since 2004. Like what, what's been the key to your longevity with this? I think it's relationship building, right? And, my attitude is if you shine, I shine, and I don't want to be transactional with you. I want to be transformational with you. And so that means we're building something, right? We're building something. And you're in the business of seeing what you can get from me and you want to be transactional, we probably won't build together. But if mm -hmm. you're about building a relationship and connecting on a deeper level is that I can help you shine and in turn 
that's going to reflect back and maybe not right away. It could be five, 10 years from then, right? But that's all good and that's all love. And that's the way that, you know, I've looked at it. So relationships have been really, really key and critical because what I've discovered, and I think it's one of those really wonderful, unexpected things is I've been meeting people. When you think about all the public speaking that I've done, you know, I've done public speaking and since early 90s, right? I've been doing that. Formally, quote unquote, I've been doing it since 2002, but I've been meeting young people, meeting individuals where they are for, for decades. Those individuals have grown up and guess who they remember? Put them on back in the day, me. So now they're in positions of influence and decision makers and I get these notes on LinkedIn, Twitter, DMs on Instagram. Hey, you might not remember me, Casey, but you spoke at my school. My mom got you to sign this book. I happened to be at this conference. And now I'm with this company, this business. I'm doing this. I've started mine. And I thought of you when this idea came up, when this project came up, when this conference came up. And I immediately put your name forth. That's what's been happening for 18 years. And it's been gaining more momentum, which has been really magical when you think about it. But I didn't plan it that way. It's just yeah. been organic the way it's all played out. And, you know, my wife always points out, she said, you put all those seeds out there, not knowing that they would grow into oaks. Just to kind of, I guess, peel the curtain back a little bit. You asked me before we started recording, like, What's your end game with this? This, of course, being Revision Path in this podcast. And the way that you just expressed that, I think, maybe ties into what I I guess I could see the end goal of Revision Path being in that there's all these stories about Black designers and developers and creatives and such that people can learn about. And to me, my hope is that this helps inform you know, as many people as possible that like, we're out here, we're a creative force, we're doing this work in terms of like planting those, those seeds, as you mentioned. So yeah, just, you know what else you're creating a time capsule, you're creating a time capsule, that's going to be a wayfinder for the next generation. So you need to realize that when I, mean, I know we talked about you creating some kind of other creative effort off of this. And so now start thinking, and you know, exactly what I just said, I know you wrote it down. I did. <laughs> I just said that. I, no, I know you did because because look, we we did our little prep call right convo before this, uh -huh. right? Our warm up, and this just came to me. This is a time capsule, and imagine if you're a young person trying to find your way, and we can only envision ourselves in a position if we see ourselves there. Mm -hmm. Well, they get to hear ourselves. They get to hear these voices. So you're creating this audio time capsule. Come on, man. Shoot. That's fire. That's fire. I'm telling you, right? First one's free, Maurice. First one's free right okay. there. Okay. <laughs> Receive that, bro. Receive that. So, I mean, before, you know, striking out on your own and doing your own thing, I think people probably know you well from your work that you've done at Nike because it sounds like it was a very, very unique experience for you. Like, talk to me about that. Yeah, you had a couple of the guests on here that are Nike alums, Jeff Henderson and Kevin mm -hmm. Buffoon. Those are two of my uh, partners in crime and positivity, right? So they're good brothers and we've done some fun projects together. And, you know, my time at Nike, you know, I always, you know, reference it in this way that Nike let me fly my freak flag. <laughs> Nike let me really stretch my wings creatively and to discover things about myself that I didn't know or that were lying dormant because of other experiences and I didn't get encouraged to express it. And Nike gave me permission. And in doing so, unlocked a lot of my creative energy and my creative confidence. And so I think that's been something I'll always be grateful for at Nike. And I think I reciprocated with creating a more sense of belonging and connection there at Nike and Nike at large, right at the other locations around the world. And so, yeah, I got an opportunity to do lots of different projects and work in lots of different areas from footwear design to special projects with Tinker Hatfield and his group to leading, um, being the director of internal communications 
working there. So Nike really gave me an opportunity to tap into a lot of my gifts and talents. And they saw value in allowing someone to have all these experiences. And remember I said, I didn't, don't think I have a career path. I have a career portfolio. Mm-hmm. Nike was a place that let me put more arrows in my quiver of that portfolio, if you will, right, of that career experiences. And so, yeah, I've always felt that Nike was this amazing living lab for me that I got a chance to do and try lots of different things and discover a lot of things about myself. I remember listening to an interview where you were talking about how Phil Knight, who is the, or I think he still is, or maybe he was the CEO of Nike, but he kind of referred to you as the mayor of Nike. Yeah. Yeah. So he he's uh, retired now, but he was the co-founder, CEO, and chairman at the time um, when I was there, 97 to 2004. And he caught wind of some of the creative capers I was doing on campus and the impact I was having. And so he asked me to have a regular meeting with him monthly and to discuss with me the people and the culture and how things were going there. So he kind of uh, coined that term for me, said, I might be CEO and chairman here, but you're like the mayor here and you know this place. So I would give him information and share, you know, how people were feeling, what was going on and being that bridge for him, you know, being a an executive, you're not necessarily privy to that. So I was giving him that insight and visibility to how the people were feeling, what was going on and opportunities for him to continue to further advance the culture in a positive way. I want to switch gears here a little bit. I, you know, as I mentioned to you before, I listened to some interviews and things, and and you really talk a lot about how like your personal story can be a catalyst for someone else to kind of chase their dreams. So I want to dive a little bit into your personal story. Tell me about what it was like growing up in Philly. Listen, Philly's grimy. I love Philly that way. <laughs> and and uh, we take a lot of pride in that with our, with our city and everything. So, you know, my childhood was, was challenging because of, you know, the circumstances that we were navigating as kids, me and my two brothers. And so addiction and abandonment, upheaval and uncertainty, dysfunction, disappointment were the norm because my parents were addicts and my grandparents rescued us. And, you know, the thing that I think my grandparents, maybe not necessarily realizing it, but because of their age, we had a lot of freedom as kids to make a lot of decisions that probably shouldn't be making when you're a kid. But we, you know, out of necessity and just they couldn't keep up with us that way. So we had a lot of freedom. And so I discovered the playground in my neighborhood first. That was kind of the epicenter of our neighborhood. But it was this place where I felt I felt I belonged first. And so sports was a big thing in our neighborhood. And I realized that very quickly. And so I dove headlong into sports and played every sport you could imagine, whatever the season I was playing it. But it was never for trophies or first place or medals. It was always for belonging. Like I loved being part of a team and connecting and being a part of that. And so that was, I think, uh, an unlock for me was being part of a team and finding a place to belong. And it was a positive way for me to channel a lot of the questions I was having as a kid because of the decisions my parents made. And so sports really was a great outlet and a great uh, coping tool for me to manage that. And then public library was another great place. I loved learning and reading. Mm -hmm. So I went to the public library a lot. And then my best friend's mom became my mom in many ways, Miss Lane. And so she poured into me as much wisdom as possible every day. I had a key to their house since I was nine, still had that key to their house. And that Miss Lane was the cheat code, if you will, for me, right? She gave me all of the the different ways to unlock possibilities and potential. And I always say it was just two words that she uh, would speak to me. Why not? And she would always, you know, answer any of my like, Miss Lane, Miss Lane, I got this idea. She'd always say, well, why not? But then she'd always follow up with, don't talk about it, be about it. Mm -hmm. Lots of talkers and very few doers. Which one are you? So I learned about action, right? And accountability from her, but also someone who was unconditional in their love and just hope for me to be successful. And Miss Lane was the person who poured that significance idea into me. 
right? That you are going to be successful because you've got intellect and smarts, but I want you to chase something bigger and grander. I want you to chase significance. So that's where that all stems from. So that childhood started off difficult, but I found a way to rise above it and didn't do it alone. And I think that was one of the key things for me was when I talked about relationships earlier, that's where I learned relationships and the importance of them. Right. And it served me well all the way through me being on my own now for 18 years. Relationships stem all the way back to my childhood. Mm. And, you know, it, it takes a village. You know, like you said, you're staying with your grandparents and then you had Miss Lane. You had your your sports teams that you were a part of. So you had all of these different influences as you were growing up. And these crazy people at the playground, because, you know, playgrounds, are they got some, <laughs> they got some colorful folks that are up there so yeah so i mean i i tell people i'm a mosaic of many people drug dealers and users and war veterans and can't ain't quite right folks in the head folks i mean just all kinds of people were there other kids parents yeah right food service workers custodians they all poured into me and my brothers right and so i know that i'm a mosaic of many people so after you you know graduated high school you went on to college and then after college, you went into the military. You went into the Air Force. What was behind that decision? Yeah, I became a young dad. So mm. I didn't even finish college. I was in my junior year, became a young father. I was 20 years old. And I came home and my grandfather said, so what are you going to do about this? He said, you need to do the right thing. And he said, you need to not repeat history and be an absent father. And so that was a loud message from my grandfather, right? And so these are his sensibilities. So I made a decision to join the Air Force, not go back to college. I figured I could finish it while I'm in the Air Force, but I wanted to provide for my family. So I went in the military. My uncle was in the Air Force, so that's why I chose the Air Force. And I, I told, I told uh, people, they said, why did you pick the Air Force? I said, my uncle always was smiling, so I figured he must be enjoying it. So... That's why I picked the Air Force over any other branch and joined the Air Force. That was my first time I ever been on an airplane was going to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas and landed in Texas and had no idea that I would end up and really enjoying the Air Force and learning so much about myself and discovering I had other gifts and talents that had not been discovered yet. I had a language ability in the military and discovered that and end up becoming a language translator in the military and working with a top secret clearance and doing all this clandestine work, blah, 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 kind of crazy stuff. So I speak a bunch of languages and did that in the military. And once again, more relationships, right? I'm still connected to a lot of people that I met when I was in the Air Force from 1980 to 1990. Mm -hmm. So 10 years I was in there, I'm still connected to a lot of those people too. So we go back to that. What's that through line for me is relationships and the importance of it and not being transactional with people being transformation. And I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over the language part. Cause I mean, I think that's <laughs> something which is, is super interesting because when you were in school, you had started to learn Spanish, but you dropped yeah, out. Is I, that right? I dropped, yeah. I dropped Spanish. <laughs> it was five minutes. It was, a, it was an amazing five minutes, Maurice. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought it was a silly class. So I walked out of class, but, the funny thing is I never forgot that five minutes. Es Susana en casa, no la casina. Donde está la sala, no la casina. Like literally that stuck. But I was a, you know, a bit of a knucklehead and young and I didn't realize I had a <laughs> gift then. And the military, they test you and it's smart, right? They test you in everything just in case you have a talent that hasn't been discovered. And lo and behold, I passed this language test in the military in basic training. And that's how I got uncovered. And so I ended up learning Serbian and Croatian and Czech and German and, yeah, become fluent in those and, and do that work in the military. But, yeah, that's how it ended up happening. But I can always reflect back to the fact that I actually always had it in me. I was just a bit of a hard head back in the day. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, had I hung in there, I'd have Spanish in my repertoire. I'm sure if I put some time to it, I can learn that, too. Well, I mean, I think if you know German, German's a romantic language. So mm -hmm. I think Spanish might be not not a total like one to one, but I feel like you probably could pick up Spanish pretty well yeah. if you know German. Yeah, I think it's they're in that family. Germanic is a little harsher than Spanish. Not 
Germans, you wouldn't necessarily equate that like romance language. Ah, it's a little harsh, a little strong, mm-hmm. but yeah, but, but it is uh, definitely what I've discovered is once you learn a language, you are what I say, uh, uh, language curious, if mm-hmm. you will. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you're just open to hearing what people are saying and how they're using their words and what does that word mean? And yeah, I, I use Google Translate like all the time, right? Like yeah. I really am fascinated with what was that language and what was that I heard? And so, yeah, I think that's the the thing that really helps you. And a lot of folks that are American don't necessarily aren't learning other languages. And I think that's a big misstep here in the U.S., right? Because you go to other countries and people are fluent in other languages, right? Because they're just open to that. And they're also raised that way. Yeah. So I just think it's so important. You, you're not going to learn a language only taking the class twice a week for 50 minutes, though. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so that ain't working, right? So, oh, yeah, I took Spanish in high school. Yeah, well, how, how often did you have? Yeah, well, twice a week for 50 minutes. I said, how much do you remember? Nothing. Yeah, yeah because you've got to be immersed <laughs> in it. So, yeah, so I think that's the other thing, too, is you have to be curious about it and want to keep learning it. <sighs> Yeah, French was my language. My mom had a uh, French is her first language. There you go. So, but she also like studied French and stuff in school and everything. And so I remember being a kid. She's a retired biologist, but she had all her like college level French books at home. So I started learning French in second grade. Yeah. And then basically like learned it from second grade all the way up until I graduated college. But and the it was other like a, is you were around it all the time. Yeah, that's true. We practice it. See, that's the problem is that if you don't have a way of actually exercising and using the muscle, right, and using the words to gain confidence, that's why people like fall off from their language learning. Yeah. So you had a built in tutor, right? You had something there, you were immersed in it. You probably had either magazines or periodicals or different things you could read in French, all that stuff that immerses you. That's what happened in language school in the military. It's like you are fully immersed. I can sing, roll out the barrels and check and all these other things. Like, yeah, we used to dress, you know, we'd have, we'd get dressed in cultural clothing and different things. So you really, you know, understood what it was you were learning. So a full immersion is the key. So you had that definitely had the right kind of environment to get really fluent in, in that language. It's so interesting when you kind of say it that way, especially about the Spanish part, because when I got to middle school, seventh grade, I wanted to take Spanish so bad. And like, it was the first language elective that had filled up super quickly. Cause I was like, I didn't want to take French cause I already knew French. And I felt like yes. it wouldn't have been fair for me to take French when I already knew it. Like everyone else was learning it. And I would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Under toi, rouge blanc, whatever. <laughs> I would already know it. So I was, I was doing good in French. I ended up taking French, but I did want to take Spanish. I mean, I can kind of understand a bit of Spanish now, but I mean, even with French, like I can listen to French music. I can read French books. I I can understand it, you know, and it, it does, like you say, like knowing another language does kind of make you language curious and opens you up to just more culture. I think. Yes. Yeah. More culture, which is never a bad thing. Right. I mean, yeah. The world is flat now, right? We have access to everything, right? From everywhere. And so I just think it's really, you do yourself a, a disservice if you're not curious, you know, around these opportunities and things to broaden your your viewpoint and, and outlook on everything. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you have languages in your life, right? Maybe that'll be the takeaway from our conversation is get some language in your life. Right? <laughs> so. So foreign you, language, not just English language. Foreign yeah, language. foreign. Yeah. <laughs> so you did, you know, you had ten years in the Air Force. After you left there, like, what was your next step? What were you thinking about doing? You know, I got my degree while I was in the service. Got a certification as an athletic trainer. I was actually working some NFL summer training camps when I was in the military. Did an Armed Forces Sports Program. Was actually the only certified athletic trainer in any branch of the service. So I got a chance to travel and support um, armed forces sports programs around the world while I was still in the service. So I decided I was going to do athletic training when I got out of the service. So I left after 10 years, moved back to Philadelphia, actually uh, was a single dad then. So raising my boys and started working in high school as an athletic trainer and a health teacher. Then I got a job at 
college level as an athletic trainer. And then I ended up in the NBA as the only the, the first black trainer in the history of the NBA for the Philadelphia 76ers and the third in the history of the NBA. Wow. So that was in 1995 and did that for two years. And then that was the springboard. And my languages were the springboard to me actually getting noticed by Nike. So when I was with the 76ers, huh. I actually got... I'm encouraged to use Serbian in the middle of a game to insult the player from the former Yugoslavia. <laughs> My coach told me to start saying something about his family when he run by because he wouldn't expect it from our bench and distract him a little bit to save a timeout. Literally, that's what my coach asked me to do. Wow. So I start cussing at this dude every time he runs by. and He's seven feet tall, right? So I'm mumbling, whispering stuff every time he goes by our bench and he can't figure out where it's coming from. <laughs> So he turns in the middle of the game and says, who's insulting my family in Serbian over here? And the coach points at me, goes, that little guy right there. And Vlade's like, there's no way. And I go, Dobar dan, how's me gospodine? And he's like, what? And after the game, he came and approached me. And you're going to love this because you're based in Atlanta. He asked me to join the Yugoslavian national basketball team for the 96 Olympic Games in Atlanta. Wow. And so I joined them as the sports medicine liaison and their translator. Wow. Black dude from Philly working with the Yugoslavian national basketball team. I got this crazy old school Polaroid picture of all of us, right? I'm the, I'm the only raisin in the milk, right? So I'm the only <laughs> raisin in the milk. And uh, yeah, so it's this really great kind of like candid picture of all of us from a Polaroid uh, from that moment when we were doing the pre-Olympic tour. Yeah. And so- that's how folks at Nike actually found out about me. Wow. I mean, languages really did unlock something for you. I mean, of <laughs> course, you, you kind of had the interest in sports. So being an athletic trainer, I'm sure it kind of was almost like a fulfillment of a wish that you kind of had as a kid, I would imagine. Well, it's so funny. I thought I was going to be in the NBA, like, you know, as all kids like play sports, like I'm going to be in the league one day, right? As a player, I'm thinking, I didn't think that my intellect and my ability to learn and then the understanding of games and then learning the science behind injuries and all that would actually propel me to that position. So when I actually got to the NBA, I paused and really thought about like, whoa, I never thought it would be like this, but I made it to the league. How about that? Right. And then of <laughs> course, them haters from back in the day that told me it wasn't going to happen. As soon as I got that gig, guess who was calling for tickets, Maurice? Yo, Kev, hook us up with some tickets. No, nah, remember that thing you said back in the day? I remember. <laughs> I kept receipts. No tickets for you, no tickets for you, no tickets for you. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, yes. But I ended up getting to the NBA, which was a you know, roundabout, crazy way, unexpected way. But, yeah, made it to the league. Wow, man. And then, like you said, that sort of opened you up to end up doing work for Nike and you started your own business. I mean, you really have – you've lived like – four lives <laughs> I, mean, exactly. with all, I mean like with all these different careers and like the way that they've all intersected i mean that is that's fascinating it doesn't make sense now right when i say that it's not a path it's a portfolio when did you decide to start writing so miss lane my best friend's mom right who's like my mom mm -hmm. she was the one who kept like bugging me like when i got to nike she kept saying when are you going to write a book when are you going to write a book? And I would always push back, Miss Lane, what do I write a book for? And she was persistent. I want to say for at least five years, she kept bugging me, bugging me, bugging me about it. And then finally, I said, Miss Lane, well, who's going to read it? And she said, well, there's another you out there that needs to know what's possible. That's who you should write it for. Bet. That was the moment. I went, okay, bet. I'll do it. But then I went, I don't want it to be like a regular book. So I'm going to use all this creative energy I've learned at Nike, right? And all these things. I'm going to create this proposal that's going to be so amazing that they're just going to clamor for this book, right? And I put together this proposal that was unique and different. Crickets. Nobody wanted mm. to do it. Rejection. In fact, one publisher said it was over-designed and too creative. Ooh. And actually told me to dumb down my idea. And maybe they'll consider doing my book. And then I made a decision. I'm going to self-publish it. Uh. So I started the process of self-publishing it in 2003, 
we got it done by 2004 and it took off. We sold 11,000 copies in nine months. And I didn't realize that was determined to be a successful book because in the industry, if you sell more than 8,000, which is basically getting beyond your friends and family, that Mm -hmm. that's a successful book. And we had done that with just word of mouth, no back table sales. I wasn't pitching it on stage or anything. And and someone at ESPN happened to get a copy of my book and they were starting a books division. And I got a call out of the blue from ESPN. They wanted to sign me to a book deal. And I was still at Nike when all that happened. And so I signed a book deal with ESPN and Disney while I'm at Nike. And that really starts this great opportunity to write more books and everything. But Miss Lane was the person behind that, the decision to write a book. Well, the indecision, but the lovingly shoving me towards my destiny kind of moments and stuff. But I'd mm-hmm. always loved books. The public library you know, was always a really special place for me as a kid. So I'd always loved books and I'm always surrounded by books, but I never envisioned myself being an author. Like that was never anything I imagined or thought of even in my quiet time. But you know, now that I've, you know, done four books, I'm quite proud of them. I love that you self-published first. And then the success from that is what sort of ended up having publishers, you know, kind of coming to you for doing more books. I love that part. Yeah. And I think that sometimes you have to know what you're writing it for. Like, what's the end game? Let's go back to that, right? Yeah. What's the end game? And when she basically said, well, there's another you out there that needs to know it's possible. Oh, okay, bet. I'm going to do it then. So until you kind of have that in mind, who you're doing it for, and then we just talked about this time capsule. I know for you, you can see someone on opening up this time capsule, if you will, figuratively and literally, right? With all of these gifts and they're unearthing these voices and these stories. Yeah, like that's the spark for you then. That's catalytic. And so she was that catalyst for me to share story. And, you know, then I made, you know, kind of that, like, well, I'm not going to do a regular book. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, you know, being, having that attitude. And, you know, that decision actually was so interesting with the book. It won over 23 design awards. My book did. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, working with a great p- design team and then working with a great print team that did the self-published piece. And ESPN didn't change anything in the design. When they signed me to the book deal, they just put their logo on it, and that was it. And so that book's been in print with them since 2005 and still in print. And I think there's over 400,000 in print now. Catalytic with a K. Yes, yes. (laughs) Now, the metaphor of like the red rubber ball comes up a lot in your books. And I mean, of course, people can sort of check out the books and and know what that's about because you literally have one book called what is your red rubber ball? But for how would you suggest that listeners out there find their own red rubber ball? So it's a metaphor, the the red rubber ball. It's literal for me, right? Because of sports and play, you know, and the playground being the first place that I felt like a sense of belonging and connection. But for most people, it's more about the metaphor. What are you chasing? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What inspires you, right? To go after it. And so I think That's a fundamental question. You need to know what inspires you to get out of bed every single morning. You have to have something. And that became even more evident during this pandemic, right? Because this global traumatic event broke a lot of people who didn't have that clarity of purpose and passion and intention, and they felt lost. It derailed a lot of people. It broke a lot of people. And then there were some people who had this discovery moment, right? And they doubled down on the thing that they cared about, right? And they learned more during this pause. And so I just think that the red rubber ball is about what are you chasing? What inspires you to get out of bed in the morning? And that you want to chase it every single day. And then if you can be blessed and fortunate enough to find a way to blur your passion and your play, that's like great. Maybe you don't necessarily, your work isn't your play, but you can always know that this is something I'm chasing. This is something that inspires me and I want to keep that close. That's the red rubber ball. When you look back at your career 
and all of your like life experiences that you've had. Is this how you imagined yourself as a kid? Never, never. I never imagined myself like this, honestly. So this is when I went to college, when I first went to college, right after high school, when I went to college, here was my job career idea. I was going to be in public relations in a bank. What? How random is that, dude? How <laughs> random is that? But Maurice, this is how this got in my head. So when I would ride the trolley, the trains in, in Philly and out on the main line, I would always see these men just dressed sharp, right? With mm-hmm. briefcases. And so I envisioned in my head, oh, they must work in a bank because I always see people dressed nice going in the bank. Okay. So maybe they're in there doing, I don't know public relations. I don't know where I got that idea of public relations. So I said, I want to do that. So when I went to college and people would ask me, so what do you hope to accomplish? In your college? Oh, I want to work in public relations in a bank. I like, I would spit that so fast, public relations in a bank. And people would always look at me curiously like, well, that that's very clear <laughs> what you want to do. Yeah. So I was about some fits. I loved how cool they looked and clean, right? And their <laughs> dress, briefcase. Okay. And I obviously was interested in stories, public relations, but I didn't have the word storytelling. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. And there's no way in my wildest, wildest, wildest dreams could I've ever imagined doing what I'm doing right now. Like zero chance. The NBA thing was probably the only thing I might have spoke out Mm -hmm. and got laughed, like laughed, like, you know, basically just laughed at. Right. And that squashed when I was a kid and my attitude was, I'll show you, you watch, I'll show you. And then I end up in the NBA. That might be the only thing that I had a inkling of an idea. But of course, no one believed that would happen. But other than that, there's zero chance I imagine what I'm doing right now, like zero chance. I just knew that I needed to be around a ball. Right. So sports and play books around education and enlightenment and just raising your game and elevating your game to learn more of the curiosity piece and betterment. So people bettered me. And so how can I better others? And so those are my three B's that I look at the ball books and betterment. And that's kind of how I, I've always been about, but right? I've I recently, you know, had got that clarity, but those are three things that have been consistently in my life and a constant for me. What gives you the purpose now to keep doing the work that you do? There's another one out there that needs to know it's possible. Miss Lane. So I made a promise to her before she passed away. It's been eight years now. And um, I told her, I'm going to be the next you, Miss Lane. I'm going to be that encourager for the next generation. I'm going to use technology and all these things. I'm going to have greater reach and impact, but I'm going to be the next you. And I'm going to remember what you said. There's another you out there that needs to know it's possible. So that's what gives me the passion to do this each and every day that there's someone that needs to hear from me, see a project I'm working on, maybe collide with somebody that I've already impacted, something like that. But I know there's another one out there. So that's what I do the work for on behalf of them. Now, you talked earlier about, you know, significance versus success. I'm curious, you know, what does success look like for you now? I mean, it's happening, right? I'm doing it and I'm proof of that you can find success, right? Circumstances don't have to dictate your destiny. You can rise above that. Got to have you know that passion, purpose, and intention and that clarity around what it is that you want to chase. So that's success. I have that, right? Significance is what I'm chasing. Mm-hmm. So I can point to, like you said, I've had four or five different lives. They've all been successful. Easy to point to that, right? But significance, I haven't reached that yet. Like I haven't gotten to that point where I've got this really amazing platform that I'm impacting lots of people on a regular basis. I'm doing it kind of in piecemeal now, right? So, you know, I'm hoping, I mean, speak it into existence. I want to have a TV show, right? Mm -hmm. I want it to be a Saturday morning show, right? Where I'm inspiring young people and they're seeing themselves in me, but not to be the host or anything, but seeing all these journeys and all these experiences that I've had and know that it's possible for them. And so how can I introduce them to all these different careers and show them, you know, this wonderful multicultural 
expertise that's out there so that they can see themselves in these roles that maybe they quietly imagine themselves doing, but not speaking them into existence or letting anybody know that they really want to do that because they've not seen themselves in that role. So how can I be that unlock? How can I be that wayfinder? How can I be the plug for folks? How can I be a cheat code? That's what I want to do. So that would be the end game for me, right? Is this programming of some sort, traditional Saturday morning or, you know, on a digital platform, but have the reach and impact so that I can be that Miss Lane for the next generation, that CEO, that chief encouragement officer. I can see a Netflix series in your near future. I totally That's can see up. it. That's what's up. See? That's what's <laughs> up. Right? See? <laughs> your lips got the ears. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do this, Maurice. Yeah. You be what? one of the people on the show. I'd be talking about you. We're now interviewing Maurice Cherry, <laughs> right? And, and, and how he created a time capsule of black and brown voices. Right. To encourage people to go after. Right. And see, there it is. Right. It's already happening. Episode five. Right. Limited there you series, go. Right? Season. Right. Or it might be like season nine. Right? So. <laughs> I mean, you dropped already so many just like pearls of wisdom in this conversation. I mean, it, it almost it almost feels a bit selfish to ask this. But like, what advice would you give somebody that wants to sort of chart the same kind of, I guess, path, to, to call it that. How can someone follow in your footsteps? How can someone be like you? Do you, right? And and, and be the best you, yeah. I think, is the advice that I'd love to give folks. And I'll go back to the original thing I brought up. I have no special talents. I'm only passionately curious. And I think curiosity for the win, right? FTW, right? Curiosity. That's going to unlock, right? That's going to help you stay in beta as a human being, right? Always updating, always improving. I say this all the time. We're so quick to update those apps on our devices and our computers. But what about ourselves? We're the greatest app ever created, Maurice. There is no app greater than us. We're so quick to update those apps on the devices. Update yourself. That starts with curiosity. That starts with wanting to raise your game. And that's going to unlock all kinds of possibilities and potential because you stay in beta. You're always in this mindset, right, of improving, of getting better, of leveling up. And that's the key. And so that would be my advice. That would be the thing that I think would really make a difference for someone to chart their own path to significance and to have a career portfolio of lots of amazing experiences. And to go beyond just the path, right? Right. We go into a super highway. That's what we want. Yeah. A super highway, right? Of of experiences. And I, I think it's available for everyone. And it doesn't I'm proof, right? Circumstances don't have to dictate your destiny. I've seen it all over the world. I've seen people do a lot with very little. We're resourceful and resilient well beyond our circumstances, but we gotta surround ourselves with the right other mindset and people who believe in the same things. Haters are your motivators. They're going to be out there and they're real. But find people who are like-minded and about the same things and keep them close. Keep those people close because they're going to be the ones that help you when you're really struggling because you're going to, it's not a clean, straight path. It twists and turns and challenges you. And, you know, I always say this too, Maurice, doubt is success testing you. Hmm. When doubt appears, when doubt comes into your mind, that self-talk, that You're not good enough. This isn't going to be available. This is never going to happen for you. Are you ready to dance with doubt? Are you ready to fight the good fight on behalf of that hope, that dream, that aspiration that you have? Then you're ready to battle. Then you're ready to dance, right? And that's the key, right? Are you willing to fight for this when it's not going to be easy, when there are challenging times? That's the key because that's going to unlock things that you never thought were going to be possible. And, you know, one of the things that's clear, right? My journey, expect the unexpected, right? Because there's a lot of unexpected stuff that's happened. Mm -hmm. It continues to happen in my life and just expect that, right? And respect it. Well, just to kind of wrap things up here, Kevin, I mean, again, you've given so much in this interview, my God. Where can people find out more about you and about your work and everything online? 
Just at me, at me, at KC Catalyst with a K. That's easy. K A T A L Y S T. Yep. So K C K A T A L Y S T. At me. You find you can find me on all my social is that and easy to find me LinkedIn that way. And yeah, that's what you can find out more about me that way. Yes. And if I can be of service to the next gen, especially, right? Or the young at heart, right? And folks that are just trying to advance something, I'm happy to do it. Sounds good, man. Kevin Carroll, thank you so, so much for for coming on the show. I mean, I had an idea, I think, how the conversation went, because as I mentioned you before, I've been listening to your interviews all day prepping for this. But I mean, the unexpected twists and turns that are just a part of your story. I mean, I think what anyone will take away from this is that you are someone that embodies like curiosity and really just a passion for for learning that has definitely taken you to where you are now. And the fact that you're also still paying it forward to so many people is is astonishing. So I see that Netflix series in your future. <laughs> it may not be Netflix, maybe it's Hulu. May I mean there's like a what a dozen streaming services or something now. But I see it happening because I mean this kind of message I mean it's an important message, but I think especially right now it's so important because of what's happened over the past few years. I think a lot of people have just kind of felt stuck and this period of time has caused them to think about well, what's the next thing going to be? So they need they need that catalyst. They need the KC catalyst. That's what That's they need. Right, yeah. So my my buddy would call me the hope peddler. He said, "You got to <laughs> peddling that hope, bro." I'm like, "That's right. I got what you want. I got what you need. Come on, let's go." Right? Yeah, so hope Abs- will not be canceled, my man. Hope will not be canceled as long as I'm out here. Absolutely. Thank you so so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Abs- uh, my my honor and pleasure, man. Time capsule. I'm gonna just leave you with that, Maurice Chair. Time capsule. Right. This is what your program is going to become. There you go. Big, big thanks to Kevin Carroll, and of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Kevin and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Transcripts provided by Brevity and Wit. So what did you think of the interview? Better yet, what do you think about the podcast overall? Don't be a stranger. Hit us up on Twitter or Instagram. Just search for Revision Path, all one word. Or you can leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on Spotify. Five stars, of course. You know, the more people that you tell about the show, the bigger we become and the further we can extend our reach to talk to black designers, developers, artists, and other digital creatives from all over the world. As always, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.